COVID-19, why you do this to me? I really don't like being stuck in quarantine. I have no toilet paper, I don't even have a snack. Hey, coronavirus, I want my life back. Ah, my mic was off the entire time. My mic was off the entire time. I'm sorry, everybody. All right. That's it. No supper for you tonight, Parker. That's it. Oh, the wonderful things. I said such incredibly witty things you missed so much. I'm not going back and saying them. That was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I was, I, was, I was profound, and I was witty, and I was... No, I really was, and I talked about the weather. What a lame thing to do to start off a show, right? Hope everybody is doing okay. So it's my official way to say hello to everybody. My feet are grateful I found a box full of sandals. Yes, we're into the, our, what we are grateful for, and they're coming in fast and furious right now. I'm grateful for sound. A lot of people would prefer to have me with no sound, Mike. Uh, just uh, Linda says to repeat it all. No, I am not going to do that. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, oh, what, what, put up, what does Linda mean sexy? The one, the one comment there below the one you just did. What do you mean, Linda? Are you being forward? I don't know. Okay. Uh, oh, Paula says, grateful for standing cooling off in the rain. So I'm guessing, Paula, you're up in possibly the Orangeville area. That's the only rain I can sort of see in the, in the area right now. There is something down, it looks like near Oakville, just off, uh, off the lake, off Port Credit, off Oakville. Uh, so, yeah, so it, they're just small little things right now. It's uh, that uh, feeling in the air. A couple of more things to be grateful for, and then we're going to get to our guest, which is a very, a really interesting guest today that we're going to be talking about mental health, and we're going to be talking about you getting off your butt and doing something about your mental health. Uh, I'm grateful for air conditioning. Yeah, I had said that's what my, uh, what I was grateful for today was the air conditioning is finally working in the building again. So, um, I, you know, it really does make you grateful for it that we, we were without it here for a, uh, a while. Okay, that is it for that. And we are going to get to our guest who is joining me from his home in, uh, near Hanover, New Hampshire right now. He is uh, Dr. Michael Bennett, and he is the author of a book. And you know what, Michael, because you're not on mainstream television right now, you you are uh, I can say it. it it's it's okay I can say it. let's show the book let's show let's show the book and people will see what what I mean. At on regular television. No, you don't. <laughs> so if they, so if they ask you what's the what's the title of the book is it is it you just say F feelings. Yeah, uh, we've been doing a, a blog for a few years to try to see whether we could get the uh, answers going and make them interesting and deal with questions from people who are writing in. And somehow or other, uh, Fuck Feelings captured the spirit of the thing, but yeah. we didn't think a publisher would ever want to name a book that. So we were kind of surprised and delighted uh, when uh, Simon & Schuster said, fine. <laughs> Great. So this this book actually has been in print for five years, a bestseller, New York Times a best a bestseller list. Uh, I've just recently been reading on it and have ordered it, so I've not yet read it yet. Uh, but 
you know what? It, it still holds true, very much true today as it, as it did five years. I'm not saying the world has changed that much, but no more so during to- this time of isolation. It, what, is, what is the Reader's Digest version of what the book is about? Well, basically he said um, people have a lot of ideas about how good it is to get your feelings out and understand them and uh, go over them. And they think therapy is all about that. Uh, what are your feelings? What are your real feelings? And if you know them, it will set you free and solve your problems. And what we were saying is no such luck. And as a matter of fact, if you try to pursue therapy of that kind or any other treatment beyond the point where it can do you some good, it becomes a waste of time and distracts you from what's more important, which is trying to live your life and be a good person. Mm -hmm. Uh, In spite of the fact that very often you have to live with symptoms and you have to live with uh, pain. Okay, continue on in that vein then. So you have to live with symptoms, you have to live with pain. Well, that that's going to make me miserable, isn't it? Well, after it will make you miserable if you feel like you should be able to do better, you didn't try hard enough, you didn't see the right doctor, you didn't pursue the right treatment. But if you look at it uh, with courage and say to yourself, I've done a good job of trying to turn this thing around, and I've still got some pain, then your job is to focus on your life and getting back into it and trying not to notice your pain and trying to be very proud of what you're doing because it's a lot harder to work and be a good guy when you're in pain than when you're not. Uh, you know, Churchill called it your finest hour. And that's true. It's when you're really... Uh, fucked, excuse the expression. <gasps> Would you, you please watch your language? <laughs> in in conversation, it's almost technical language. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, do you know what? And that's what's so great about the book is, is that, you know, this is not, in fact, you co-wrote it with your daughter uh, as well, who is a comedy writer. And so yes. basically she had to take what you were saying and, t- and change it from doctor speak to something that more people would get. And that would be a very frank discussion on using, using language the way we would use it anyway. Because honestly, you know, this feeling is fucking me up. I, I will say that and I will express it to someone and someone will know immediately what I mean rather than my feelings right now are, are really challenging me. No, but if I use some strong language, and you use strong language in pretty well every chapter of this book. My education actually began in Toronto. Oh. I'd come back from college with my BA in English, and I never worked a real job, and suddenly I had to. So I was doing trucking because nobody else would hire me. (laughs) And my one asset was my driver's license. And there I was uh, loading uh, uh, pork bellies. And the guys would say, pass the fucking box, you fucker. (laughs) And it was their way of being friendly, of diffusing tension, of saying that in spite of the fact that I was sort of out of it and uh, very different from them, that they were being friendly and accepting. And for me, it was a revelation. It was the beginning of my real education. <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, we, we use these words and they do actually express something. They, they, they express a very, it's probably the most powerful language we can use. And so, therefore, if we're feeling depressed, if we're feeling anxiety and stress, and, and it's making us feel that way, well, then it's easier for me as a patient to tell you that than to even try and say, well, I just feel funny. Because quite often that, that's what a lot of patients will say when they're having an anxiety attack or a panic attack. They, their description is, it just feels funny. It's also a language that often implies acceptance, like, boy, are we fucked. It doesn't mean I did it or you did it. It just means life is being really hard right now. And that's a very good frame of mind when you want to approach a problem. Mm-hmm. 
So now we're approaching the problem in this book, and there is something that, that weaves its way through the book, and that is the prayer of serenity. How does it factor into this book? It seems to me in practice, Um, and the serenity prayer gradually seemed to me like it wasn't just a prayer, it was a procedure. That once you focused on what you had to accept, even if it was in a conversation that lasted 20 minutes, um, like about depression, say. Yeah. So I'd have a lot of ideas about how he could talk his way out of it. But maybe he'd spoken to three or four therapists and tried three or four things. And it was clear, though, it had gotten better that he'd have to live with some symptoms. Accepting it, that opened the door on creative thinking, positive thinking, making the best of it, being proud of the way you make the best of it. But you had to accept. And 12-step meetings really used that idea a lot to help alcoholics live with the shame. You had a weakness, it was partly chemical, it was whatever it was. It could turn your life upside down at any moment. Your job was to just do your best with it a day at a time and take pride in that. Yeah. And the people who could do that really supported one another. And the fact it's called a prayer, it, it does not, this, this works for people whether they are religious or not. And it, it is the foundation of good mental health. So let's look, let's look at the prayer again. Yes, it's over my face. I, I'm the one who placed it there right now, so I'm just going to look around it. So grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And those, those last words are probably the most important words, the wisdom to know the difference. And that's where I think sometimes friends or parents can be just as good as therapists. Um, you're not necessarily asking to get into anybody's deeper feelings. Uh, when you say to them in a friendly way, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. No, so no kidding. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big part of parenting. You're the person who's there when, when your child um, expresses some self-criticism over something he thinks he should be able to do. And you can testify to the fact that he's tried very hard and he's done all the things he should do. And it's just not going to happen. So, so I don't think it's confined to therapists, but it's very cognitive. And that, that, that makes it less intrusive. You're not getting into anybody's head and they're free to disagree with you. So here we are and, and we are finding that people's mental health has never been challenged as much as it has these last couple of months. And a lot of people are concerned, worried, scared. They may not come out of it, or they will come out of this worse, much worse than they were before. So let's, let's take some of the advice from your book. And that is, why am I going, why, what does it exactly mean F feelings, to, to just, dis, you know, forget about that. Well, uh, let's say a patient were to tell me that he's paralyzed with fear. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's getting more and more irritable with his family and vice versa. Uh, things are just coming apart. Now, yes, there are things he could learn about how to manage anxiety. But he's also letting anxiety turn into a lot of negative thoughts, a kind of the sky is falling and I let it fall and it'll keep on falling. So the message there is respecting that you have a right to be anxious and there's a lot to be scared about. And because you're scared, we're all about to learn some things we didn't know about before which is essential to our making good decisions. 
So as long as we don't get paralyzed by fear or get demoralized by it, it's there to help us deal with a really scary problem. We, and leadership we, is, is just that, whether it's family or otherwise. Yeah, and especially when we see a lack of leadership, we're, we're, we're even more scared. You know, who's the captain at, at, the, at the helm? We, sometimes we, we don't know. Well, around uh, here, if there was a federal uh, vacuum, a lot of the states, a lot of the governors stepped up. Uh, yeah. Cuomo was very impressive. Our Massachusetts governor was very good. Um, it's remarkable, but it is a good task. And in the long run, I think it's told us who some of the better leaders are. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Uh, you know, up, uh, in in Canada, we had a little. You know, there were, there was more cooperation uh, than than there was down there, from the federal to a, a, a provincial, or a, in your case, to the federal to state. Um, okay, so it's it, what you said there. I want to pick up on something you said there, and that is, if a patient comes into you and he's talking to me about feeling this way, you use the term "he let it happen," and sometimes we get mixed messages when it comes to treatment and therapy. It's all not your fault. Uh, you, you know, this is something you can't control, and, and it's, it's it. There is some truth to that, but it doesn't mean that we can take everything and blame it on our anxiety. You know, I'm in the position I'm in because of depression. Boo-hoo, there's nothing I can do about that. And you're telling people to get off their butt. Well, first of all, they need to explore, learn about uh, anxiety, uh, learn what we know about it, what it is, what it isn't, what helps. But ultimately, there isn't that much to learn. <laughs> there aren't that many treatments, either medical or behavioral. And before too long, as with any problem, you're back at the, so what am I going to do about it? How do I focus on getting out and working or seeing whether I can work? How much work can I do? Uh, how can I go to work and manage a panic attack rather than uh, let it put me, uh, you know, decide I, I, I can't go out of the house? I, I agree. I, I find that a lot of therapy today is is dealing with, well, let's find out what causes this. Let's 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 find out, first of all, where this came from. What did your dad do? What did your mother do? Instead of saying, OK, first thing we need to do is allow you to stand up. You know, it, it, it's like the fire department coming to your house if it's burning. And they say, okay, we're not going to put it out right now. We're going to find out how it started. And we'll go and talk to those people and try and figure out how we can make sure another fire doesn't start. No, no, just put the fire out, save my house, let me live. And, 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 and then we can move on from there. It, it, Back in the 1950s, here's what I really, I'm an old bogey. And we really thought that if we understood all your hidden feelings and dreams and fantasies, we'd be able to put out the fire. And somebody in the 60s and 70s started to study that and discovered it just wasn't happening. People had anxiety very often. It just got worse in their 30s. And if they were women, boy, the, the things that hormones do. Yeah. It was what it was. Uh, it wasn't getting better with therapy. Therapy was providing maybe some moral support, but it wasn't changing the symptoms. And that's when a lot of therapists started to work much harder at being coaches, at fighting the negative thinking, at saying, you've got to accept this. Now, whether it's meditation or just getting absorbed in your work or building some good habits, you got to live a life and live with this thing. And when it does happen, you don't want to think, oh my goodness, um, I've lost I've lost it again. You just want to think here it is again, like a migraine, and I'm going to try to get a day's work done, or I'm still going to try to spend good time with my kids. Now, Charity, can you go up to Charity's comment there, Parker? And then we'll get back to, I think, I can't remember who had it on there. Uh, so Charity says, when I go to work, I deal with my depression, but I hide it a lot from everyone. And, and that gets you into trouble. I know from personal experience, that can get you into trouble by hiding it and, and thinking you have it under control without the proper tools. 
it's very important to hide anything that's private in, you know, from people whom you don't want to know about that. Uh, partly because you can't trust all of them. It's a workplace situation. Yeah. It's like yeah. the jungle. <laughs> yeah. But let's turn out the other side. You're in your social life. Your job is to find those people who are comfortable with your depression. They not only accept it, but it doesn't make them feel very bad. Maybe they don't understand it, but they still want to be with you. And your job is not only to find those people, all it takes is one or two, but to sort of train them, to make them part of your team, to let them know that even when they can't help your depression, that they're helping you, that you're glad they're there. Um, so the helplessness of depression doesn't tear down their morale. So you build up people who do accept you, know what you're dealing with, appreciate what you're dealing with, and are there to help you out if you have a reversal of some kind. It's your job in managing depression. Nobody else will do it for you. You've got to create that team. Boy, you're, you're talking about us doing a lot of work. You are talking about us being our own advocates. Nobody else will do it. You know, the therapist, a, a loved one can point you in that direction, but can't do it for you. So with any real affliction, there's a job to do, a sort of personal responsibility, because you're sort of, you're the manager of you. Yeah. Okay, so where do we start? And, and Lori asked this question. This sounds simple, but how does one do this? Where do you start? And how do you keep that momentum going, especially if you're doing it yourself? Because you can get down on yourself very easily. Well, uh, one way is by going through the steps of trying to do your best with the depression, learning about it, and discovering what will or won't help it. Some people are very lucky with uh, a non-medical treatment or a medicine. Some people aren't so lucky or they're only partly helped. Um, psychiatrists have had more or less the same group of medicines for the last 30 years. And each one has a sort of 50-50 batting average. So it's a long, slow haul sometimes to, to work on uh, the symptoms themselves. Do you, do you see success stories uh, very often? Or is it... Sometimes. Because <laughs> not it's often enough. Not often enough. Because it's, it does. Oh. It, it sounds very simple, and it sounds like it should be easily attainable. Well, in all fairness, I think a lot of people get antidepressants from their primary care physician. Mm -hmm. As a psychiatrist, I'm more apt to see the people who are not responding. Okay. That's the trouble okay. with being a specialist. <laughs> now, I've always tried to encourage people because I was resistant to medication to begin with. I did not want to do it, but I'm glad I did. It helped me to even out. But am I too dependent on that? Am I getting too dependent on that? I would like to wean myself off of that, but I'm afraid to. I, I don't know if I should. Well, turn your fear into a risk-benefit analysis, the same as you would if you were taking a Lipitor for your cholesterol, you'd get enough information to decide whether there was any non-medical treatment like diet or exercise that would work. With uh, many of us at a certain age, diet and exercise are just not enough to control cholesterol or high blood pressure. And at that point, it's our job to pump the doctor for information on what the value is of taking medicine versus not, because it's our decision, not the doctor's decision. And when you make a decision, like playing a poker hand, like uh, Kenny Rogers, old gambler, <laughs> you make a decision that the odds are worth it. That's a decision to respect. 
It's yes, you're now you've now said I'm gonna need that medicine and have to pay for it and deal with the insurance company's bother and all kinds of things. But I've decided it's worthwhile after learning all I needed to know and making a reasonable decision. I think that's how you get past the feeling of being a helpless victim. We are, when we come on the other side of this, uh, this distancing, isolation, um, we're in for a whole lot of hurt. There, there's people talking about a pandemic of, of mental health issues that is, is going to be following. We can't, go, we can't go back to the way it was in diagnosing and treating mental health issues. I, I just do not think we're doing a very good job uh, with it. With, with, with your feelings toward this book and the other books that you have written, um, what needs to happen for us as a society to be better at dealing with people's mental health issues? I think we've come a long way in both demystifying it and making clear that it's just one of those things. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, just because science has not got to the point where we can see what's happening in the brain doesn't mean that it isn't very real and very much beyond our control. So however tough the times, that's been the first step and a huge step to take so that people who do find themselves with symptoms um, don't feel it is a failure. As far as the stress goes, I don't know. I don't know how that um, when people are really stressed, that symptoms get a lot worse um, for either that or heart disease or thyroid disease. They get a little worse. Everything gets stressed out, but only to a certain degree. I think we're used to thinking that the two are closely related because of the way the symptoms feel like you're falling apart. But I'm not sure that the incidence of depression and anxiety disorder shoot way up, way up. Maybe people get some relapses. But beyond that, no, I think they temporarily feel uh, wiped out. And then depending on themselves and their community, they start to pull it together. Okay, one last question. Are you positive? Are, are you um, feeling good about the direction we are going? Or are we just, we're just not getting it? And I'm talking about whether or not it is uh, the medical community, because you, you get different answers from different doctors, resistance from some, acceptance from others. And also our own our own attitudes, whether or not we're an employer or an employee, a patient. Are we? Are, are you thinking we're doing the right thing? We're going in the right direction. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I years ago I ran a clinic in a, a, a state mental hospital, and things were so different then. Patients and families are so much better educated now. Families are so much more helpful and help one another much more. I think the progress has been terrific and the ideas have become better and better. I, do, I wish we had better medical treatments, but as far as the values and the way we think about it, I'm just, uh, I'm very excited about the progress of the last 30 years. Definitely been a lot of progress in the last 30 years. I, I just hope we keep that momentum going and uh, that, that, that especially when this is all over because this has reignited some people's issues, uh, has triggered them, uh, and uh, in some cases has brought them to the forefront when they may not have even realized that they, they've had any mental health issues. So the book is, uh, is called F. Feelings. I'm just going to say F feelings. <laughs>
joining me. Uh, people have been remarking about the beautiful view uh, that you have. It looks like you're in the middle of a forest in New Hampshire. Exactly. <laughs> it's a great place to be. All right, it's lovely. Come back and see us in Toronto sometime. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. All right. Dr. Michael Bennett talking to me from Hanover, New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Uh, right now, it's just after 7.30, 7.31 right now uh, here in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, and uh, I, I want to talk about a few things. We're going to get to the goat line in just a moment, but we have a very busy week coming up. Tomorrow, I have to go to a funeral. So I, it's the first day I'm not going to be on, but I have something prepared for you as we take a look ahead at what is happening this week. So tomorrow... Oh, let's try, let's come back. We'll do it. We'll, we'll do it again. Hold on. Hold on. That's my fault. Hold on. I was talking. All right. I'm going to try to get. <laughs> it keeps muting. Uh, here, what we'll do. Can we pause the tape and then just bring it back there? There. All right. Q. Okay, there we go. It's finally working. Tomorrow, Invisible Voices, The Homeless. It's an isolator's documentary. You'll meet some people on the streets of Toronto. Miracle Cure, a walk in the forest. I talked to a professor from Exeter University in the UK. Going on a virtual tour of museums around the world on Thursday and then Friday, it's an Isolators celebration co-hosted by our good friend Mike Robin. All this coming up this week here on the Isolators Indeed. It is a very busy week. I keep seeing about, uh, sorry to hear about this, sorry for your loss. Um, who was it? Because I'd like to add my condolences, uh, please. To, to oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to me. Oh, yes. You, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was my Auntie Ida. Uh, loved her. I still love her. Uh, and her family. Uh, so I have to go up to uh, Whitefish tomorrow, just outside of Sudbury, uh, for that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was someone who had a lot, who had, who had experienced a loss a little bit earlier, and I wanted to send my uh, condolences. Was it, was, was it Carrie? Oh, Carolyn? Karen. Oh, Karen. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, it's been a tough time. Uh, okay. Sadly, I, okay, th this is the one. So Karen had said, tuned in tonight. I have anxiety and depression. Uh, my good friend, the landlord, committed suicide a couple of weeks ago. So, Karen, our thoughts uh, go to you. It is so tough, isn't it? And what's the first thing you say to yourself when you find out someone you know has, has taken their life? You say, I wish I would have known. Didn't seem that they were the type. Yeah, because sometimes we hide things from people and we hide things from each other. So whatever we can do to reach out. You may not think you're doing much by calling someone, right? You, you, a lot of you say you have a, a daily ritual of calling two or three people and you try to call an extra person every day. And you may not think very much of it, but... It is what you were doing could be saving a life. Think about it that way. What do we uh, what do we think of Doctor uh, Doctor Bennett? He was fantastic, very frank, frank discussion, uh, and uh, interesting. The book uh, did quite well when it was first out five years ago. So uh, pick it up now because then now it's cheaper, right? You wait five years and it's cheaper because it is uh, it, it works that way. Uh, okay. What else are we going to talk about? Oh, are we going to, should we do the phone? Should we do the phone? Okay, let's, uh, let's run. It's time for the goat line. <laughs> Seven, nine, three goats. Here we go. Hi, Kevin and Parker and everybody. It's Carol Jones calling from Quebec. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say something about last night's show. Last night's uh, guest uh, really hit home, and the uh, DNA part I found very, very interesting. It explained a lot of what has ha happened in my family. Uh, we seem to have ESP or something along those lines. And as far as encouragement goes, I know Ontario is starting to open up a little bit more, and you're getting out more, and stores are opening. And here in Quebec, we've been open for, I think, well, school's two weeks, and work at least three weeks and we've had no issues uh, very little anyway in my community and so things seem to be going along quite well cautiously so as we proceed i guess uh, the message that uh, we're given is to just dip your toe into the water don't dive in and have a good night i'll see you soon bye 
It is another gorgeous day in Ontario. Hope you guys are making the most of your social isolating and uh, keeping it real. Mike Robin up here in the Great White North, or the Great Queen North now. But uh, got a little joke for you. Oh, I was out about town uh, today. Saw a little sign, the psychic. I said, hmm, sounds interesting. So I walked up to the door, knocked on the door. The psychic yelled from inside, who is it? I went home. Have a good night, everybody. I will explain that. In a oh, yeah. thank you, Kevin and Parker, so much. You are so inspirational to all of us here as isolators. And everything you do on the sign, every person you've had on the panel has given us such inspirational. And we thank you so, so much from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. There we go. And that is our phones from the goat line. Where's the, the goat out there? I like that. Uh, I apologize. When I mixed that, the music was way too loud. I apologize. Uh, audio is not my strong point. So Mike was giving us a joke. He said he went downtown and he knocked on the door. He was going to go see a psychic. And a voice came from inside and said, who's there? So I went home. There you go. All right. Uh, oh, oh. Parker's been waiting for a reason to use that, uh, use that sound. Okay, let me address the F-bomb, okay? I saw a lot of you were talking about that. Uh, and uh, some of you were shocked by it. If, if it offended you, I, I do apologize. But I think, you know, we, we always try and put things into context. And in this case, we were talking about that word in the context of the doctor's book. Because, and, and for good reason. You know, a publishing company is not going to allow a title like that without good reason. And in this case, there was good reason because it's frank talk. It is direct and it is how a lot of people talk. And when do you, when do, well, when do the majority of people swear and swear out loud and, and you regret it later, you said it in front of the kids? It's when something terrible happens, right? So if you are going to use that word, then your depression, your anxiety probably is pretty bad. And it would be easier for you to tell a therapist or a doctor that's how you feel rather than, you know, fancying up uh, your feelings. So I promise you, I'm not going to be using the words gratuitously through, you know, through these shows. We are able to do it on, on, uh, online rather, as opposed to a, what I couldn't do on television. A lot of things I couldn't do on television, uh, such as, uh, you know, I don't have to wear socks. So that's kind of nice. That is kind of nice. It is, uh, I'm really looking forward to this week, especially, okay, let me explain tomorrow. So I have to go, and I know I promised I'd be on the air every day, and I was thinking very, very uh, heavily about that. But I, I produced a documentary on a couple of homeless people that I, that I regularly talk with out on the streets here, and it's never seen the light of day. So it will be here tomorrow in my stead. So it's called Invisible Voices. It's only about 18, 19 minutes long. But what it does is it takes those invisible voices and humanizes them because you're going to meet Gord and you're going to meet Glenn. You're not going to meet that homeless guy who is always sitting by the Tims or that, that wheelchair guy who's always begging for money. You are going to meet and listen to Gord and Glenn. They're somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's brother, sister, mother. They are human beings, and we walk by them all the time. So I invite you to, to watch that tomorrow and, uh, and comment on it. You can always call the goat line, by the way. How's my goatee doing? It's, it's still very, you know, it's still... Uh, it's getting right out here. It's getting there. I mean, it's getting a little bit of show. So uh, we, we are going to be monitoring that. But I'm very excited about the show on Thursday. I'm going to be talking to that professor I have been talking about from uh, Exeter University in, uh, in the UK. He did a study finding that if you spend time in the forest regularly, and not just five, ten minutes, but regularly, that a significant number of his, his research 
uh, 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 or students had shown significant increases, uh, uh, improvements in health problems and in their general overall feeling. And it's directly tied to being in the force. So we're going to talk about that, how long you have to spend there and why it happens. Then, of course, on Friday, we have our big celebration. Uh, I, I am forgetting. I've already talked to uh, Dave Thompson. Dave and Austin were the ones who uh, provide, who did our original music and uh, that you all know the words to. So we're going to have them on. We're going to talk about that. Maybe they're going on a road tour with that. I, I, I don't know. We're going to, uh, we're going to be talking. Well, Mike is going to co-host Mike Robin from up in Cochrane. And I need some help, uh, folks. I need, oh, Diane, put Diana's comment up. Kevin used mascara on the goatee. We could see it then. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to bring Willow on the show. Remember Willow from uh, the, the commercial her dad did? Can we, is that, I think it is Parker in, uh, oh, I think, I don't, I think it's on the other drive. I'm not sure. Is it in? It might be in the regular items. Uh, one, we're just looking for it here. Daily. Try the daily. Go down. Uh, no. Well, you remember Willow. No, it's, I think it is in the, uh, I think it's on the other drive. Can we put the other drive in? Hold on. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to get that commercial because it's such a cute commercial. But I forgot who um. introduced me to Willow and her dad. So can, can uh, for the, the person... Who, um, do you want me to find it? I can't find it. Okay, it's under, uh, yeah, go to Slate, uh, go to uh, Bizbump, uh, uh, sorry, promo stuff, and stay with me. Bizbump, there it is, it's in here, yeah, there it is. Okay, here's, here's the one with, uh, with Willow. My name is Willow. When I grow up, I must be an astronaut and go to all the planets. Jupiter, Mercury, um, Venus. I like to see Mars. Mars. <laughs> Earth is my favorite. I built a spaceship to travel to the future. I learned if we stay inside, everything is going to be okay. Please stay home if you can. Try your best. Stay healthy and be kind to each other. Uh, okay, Patricia, you answered my question. I forgot who had introduced me to Willow and her dad. So, Patricia, after the show, I need to talk to you because I would like to have Willow and her dad on the show on Friday as well. Who else do you want to see on the show on Friday just to, just to, to have fun with? Uh, you know what? I bet you everybody wants Errol back on, right? Everyone was enamored with Errol. So uh, send me a note. You can always get in touch with me. Email firstaidforyourmentalhealth at gmail.com. You can message me on Facebook. You can message me on Twitter. If you follow me and you need me to follow you so you can direct message me, I will do that. Just tell me to, to follow you. Uh, you can message me on Instagram. There's a million ways to get in touch with me. So uh, we will we will have who? Okay, you don't know them, Patricia. Well, who has? All right, someone needs to get me in touch with Willow, please, and her dad. Uh, so that's all still to come this week. So tomorrow, I hope that you will take a look at this uh, Isolators documentary, is what I'm calling an Isolators doc, and let me know what you think. And hopefully it gives you something to think about the next time you see someone who is asking you or just simply saying hi to you on, on the street. So thank you very much for joining me. And thank you very much to my guest, Dr. Michael Bennett. The book is called F Feelings. Uh, check it out, uh, Indigo Chapters, and also, of course, on Amazon. Take care of yourself and take care of each other. COVID-19, why you? Quarantine. I have no toilet paper, I don't even have a snack. Hey, coronavirus, I want my left back. Well, hey.